concept and a different way you're thinking. So I'm thinking about the robustness. Will my software be maintainable? Will my team, member be, team members be able to uh, get into my code after I finish developing this feature? And I'm thinking about design and architecture. And in a way, I'm generalizing here, but it's a long-term effort. I'm writing code that is supposed to be served for a long period of time. On the other end, research thinking, and here research can be training deep learning models, but if you think about it, it's also when you come to solve any algorithmic problem. Um, you explore new ways to solve the problem, you might need to be creative, you might need to read an academic, uh, academic paper and think whether that new solution can be applied. And generally, everything that you do is okay, as long as you get to the end results, which is could be reducing the error, or giving bit better prediction. And again, generalizing, it's a one-time effort. So I developed a model that works, it predicts the weather. If it works, it works. I don't really care how I got to there. I could have done many trials and attempts, and eventually I have something that I think works. So that's sort of the difference between them. And the problem is that on one end, you're developing software and you, in an entirely different context. And the other end, you're developing models, again, in a different context. And it, they can break each other. So one end is, I'm developing, a, that's the obvious. I'm developing a new model. I'm deploying it to production. And then it breaks the software and I get some index error. On the other end, um, you develop a new feature and you're not sure uh, whether the model will work with that feature. So those are the two obvious problems. The less obvious problems are stuff that you won't do because you don't really know if it's going to break or not. So these sort of questions, everyone that develops models come when there's an interaction with models and software. So does the software support this? If I need a new input for my model, will that work? Or on the other end, some restrictions you will apply on yourself because you say the model doesn't support that. I don't know if it will be able to give that prediction. Well, and those are stuff that you won't get an exception, but the way you will develop the software or you will train the models, you'll put your, on yourself some restrictions and you'd say, okay, I'm not going to do that because I'm not really sure whether the model is going to support that or the application is going to support that. The bottom line is that as we know that we need to do both in parallel, we came to the conclusion that we must streamline the process and do full automation. Full automation means as less as possible human intervention, that researcher on one end can train his model, on the other end, developers can uh, develop new features. So until now I talked about, sorry about that, until now I talked about models, and the question is why is deep learning different? So generally, it isn't. It can be applied to machine learning, to other areas, any algorithms. Deep learning specifically is a bit different because first, the way we train models, we train many models, and then at the end, we choose one of them. And we don't know in advance which one will go to production. So that's a different from other algorithmic stuff or uh, problems trying, we're trying to solve. The other thing is the technological explosion. Uh, that's the way I call it. Deep learning is very hyped, and uh, there's a lot of uh, getting a lot of attraction, and the frameworks are constantly being developed, and new features are being added. So the way or the traditional way to solve this problem that there's all models that are developed by researchers and needed to be deployed is usually say, okay, so I finished. I'm a researcher. I finished doing my model now. Here's, I meet the software developer and I say, okay, make it happen in production, I don't care how. And because the frameworks are constantly being developed, rewriting the model today becomes impractical, I wouldn't say impossible because we tried it at one point, but assuming you train the model, let's say in TensorFlow, and now you have some graph that predicts something, the ability to say, let's re-implement it in Python, in C sharp, whatever, it's nearly impossible because the frameworks are always advancing and you will always be a step back. Okay, 
So what's our solution? And here it's really fun to write it as four points, as if we knew everything in advance, but we didn't. And it sort of emerged from the problems we were trying to solve over time. Uh, so I'm happy that maybe you could share and take the knowledge that we gained in the past, uh, the past two years. So first is serialize your model. Butter is included. I'll deep dive into each one of them. That means make your model a binary in, uh, in uh, let's say, in high level. Add metadata to the model. Then create a shared interface. And finally, develop your architecture that would support doing both. Also creating software and software features and also uh, training models. OK. So now we're going to see some code. Um, so let's start with the first step. Serializing, oh, sorry, serializing your model. So here what we see is basically a TensorFlow, uh, the TensorFlow way of serializing a model. It means eventually saving the model into your disk. And here we see that TensorFlow uses this, the saved model builder class that allows to take a graph after it was trained and then convert it into files to your disk. The real semantics doesn't really matter. I'm pretty sure other frameworks allow that as well. Uh, at the end there, there's a link to the TensorFlow API. So that's the first part. What happens after you train the model, after you save it into a file, is that after we serialize the model, uh, which we just saw in TensorFlow, then we go to our disk, and that's what it creates. So there's basically a few things. One is the protocol buffer, which is basically the definition of the model. Uh, that's the dot .pb that you see. And then afterwards, that's the data. So eventually, what you get is no matter, and here's a model that predicts the weather, no matter how you trained it, it becomes a binary that is saved into your disk. And in a way, it's also platform independent. Wherever you can run TensorFlow, that um, it will work. And also, no matter how you train the model, which methods you used, what research you did, it doesn't matter anymore. That's history. Now you have a well-defined model that has inputs and outputs, and they're numeric. And that's one step ahead. But is it enough? Obviously, no, because I wrote it there. Because you still don't know whether you don't have any application logic here. So you only know that the model has inputs and outputs. But any applica application logic you want the model to have, you don't have it yet. You just have something very uh, premature. OK, so the next step is adding the metadata. And this is basically the question, what do we want our application to know about our model. So first thing is uh, inputs, outputs. Let's say I want to predict the weather, and I need to know the temperature of the past two weeks. Uh, so that's something our, my application needs to know, because in runtime, it will need to pass that data. Another thing is the capabilities. So again, going into the prediction the weather, let's say weather, uh, which areas the model is valid for. So it can be Jerusalem and Hebron, for example. And what's the accuracy? Because you might want to change the models in runtime. And, and another very important lesson we learned is exposing when this model is valid. So let's say I have a mod trained model that says I can predict the weather in Jerusalem, but I only seen in history that the, the temperature until 40 degrees Celsius. And if the temperature is one above 100 Celsius degrees, I can't predict the weather. So that's and, and then don't use that model. And something that is also important, less the topic of this lecture, is which data was used to train. And might be more information. This can allow to reproduce the model, although it, that's a big problem on its own how to retrain a model. But it's something that can help. OK, so here you see this is just a sim simple function. It's just a dict. But the important thing to note here that it happens uh, while, when you finish training the model. It must happen right afterwards. And then you see the model exposed, the area I'm valid for, when the train ended, max temperature, that's the data that it's seen, and the inputs that the model uh, 
expects. OK, and now the final step, shipping them together. So we have the metadata JSON. And there I put Immubit at the top. And to emphasize that, it's basically our business logic. And you have the TensorFlow uh, model. And finally, you just need to decide how you de deliver it. It can be a zip file, but it's important that they come together. If you also notice, there's a hash there to ensure that the model is unique. So you don't, um, that's important. Otherwise, you'll get into trouble. You must ensure that each delivery you make is unique. Um, OK, and I already covered most of it. But one really important thing is that this needs to be the only way that you can train a model. If you have more than one way, you're going to get, again, into problem because you might not have the metadata or might not have the full zip file. They need to be viewed as an atomic unit that comes together, model plus metadata. OK. And now, finally, or before the architecture, you create a shared interface. This is basically a contract that says, OK, so my software predicts the weather, and it needs from the model x, y, and z. On the other end, the model says, I expose uh, the areas I'm at, I can predict, and the accuracy, and so on. So it's a contract that shouldn't be broken. and needs to be minimal with no implementation details at all. This means that if you trend it in TensorFlow or PyTorch, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can use any framework you want. But it means that if I'm a researcher, I know that eventually what I need to deliver is that contract. If that contract doesn't hold, then it's not going to be used in my application. And finally, I won't cover it here if anyone wants later to talk about this. It should be easily tested. So. Uh, you could test that the contract uh, works on both, on both ends. OK, and here we're using Marshmallow just as a serialization library. It's a great tool, but you can use anything else. And you can see some of the fields here. You can have different model types, the version. This is important because you might want to introduce changes later to the model. So you put a schema version, which means and then you can add all sorts of logic if that schema changed. And other fields that we talked about previously, just whatever, this is the contract that both ends need to implement. Um, OK, and that's an example of how you can int introduce a change afterwards in your application. So let's say the schema, you want to bump the schema, then you change it, and you can use the new capabilities inside your application. OK. And last point is creating the right architecture. So many times when we come to create an architecture, we are thinking of the ideal software design that would fit or the recent hypes. And it's really important, specifically in models, to build the architecture so that you have a way to deploy the models continuously. And that's something that needs to be taken into account. And what I recommend is splitting it into different Git repo repositories. So one repository, you have the research. And the research includes the training and delivery. And it's important that they come together. Because if you separate the delivery from the training, it means it won't happen in the same place usually. So we have training, delivery, it comes together. And eventually, the research repository responsibility is delivering the model, not only training it. Then a shared interface that both parties need to implement. And finally, um, your own software obviously is split into many repositories. OK, so here I'm giving sort of an example of an architecture that uh, you see the, the main uh, point here is that you have clear ownership, who owns what. So you have the research team, that's the uh, sort of blue, the first one. And there's the training, the models training, the export the model itself, that's the ownership of the research team. On the other hand, you have the software, which is green. And then you have REST APIs, the runtime model, which wraps the real model in production. You have the application definition. And finally, you have the shared repositories. That's the model, let's see if it works, yeah, model metadata schema, and shared parser. 
So shared parcel can be stuff that are relevant both for your application and for the model and should be shared. I'll see if we have enough time, I'll, I'll, we'll see an, an example in a second. And the idea is that once you have those ownerships, if there's a breaking change, it's easy to discuss about it. You can discuss about it when you want to add it to the model metadata schema. Okay, so I'll try in two minutes giving you a brief example. Let's say you sort of, uh, like I said before, imagine we're not doing anything with weather. It's just an example, but assuming that you have like this dummy application of, that predicts the weather and you, it's by cities and you have dates and then you get a graph and let's assume it's deep learning power and you have a backend that knows how to run deep learning models. So you have some sort of a backend and a REST API and you have a research library that trains those models. So you start by the shared definitions. So the shared definition could be the application runs in Israel, for example. The training part can be what the model expects. And this is before training even happens. So you need the humidity for 30 days. You might need the temperature. And then this is how the code inside the actual application would look like. So you have a runtime model that wraps the model that was produced by the research team and delivered. So you initialize it with some sort of a backend that loads the, the model. And then, key point here is that you see the required inputs, that's something the model exposes. The application doesn't need to be aware of it ahead of time. It's something that allows a lot of flexibility for the application, that's exactly the contract. The model says, I need this. The application doesn't care exactly what it needs, it just goes, can go to the database or wherever you're storing the data and get that data. And another thing it exposes the model is the areas that are uh, being used that the model works for. Okay. Finally, there, this is a REST API. So you have like a GET request for prediction. And then, again, this is the core point here. You don't really know what's the data the model needs, but it happens inside the application because of the contract. It just forwards it to some utility function that goes to the database and search it. Okay, so I'll give a brief example about how, let's say you have a breaking change and you want to predict, okay, and you want to predict the weather for Hebron, for example, and there was no, no medal that, that was trained for that, only for Jerusalem. So the quick and dirty solution that this sort of way of thinking also allows is saying, okay, so I don't have, but let's say Jerusalem is pretty close, so let's just add inside our application the ability to say, okay, if, we, if the area is Hebron, then use the model in Jerusalem. And that can happen inside the application itself. So it's quick and dirty. We can do a bit better. And a bit better is training a new model. And then what will happen is that the new model, this happens during training, exposes its new capabilities. And then you see that it also supports a new city. Key takeaways. So first, um, train every model as if it goes to production. It could be a dummy model that doesn't do anything, but the moment you start the training, you should think how it goes to production. When that happens, stuff becomes much, much easier. Second, create an interface, which is the contract between the model and the application. Clear ownership of components, so you know who's responsible of ensuring the model goes to production and who's in responsible of its deployment, and creating architecture that supports streamlined deployment of software and models. It's important to take it into account when you build your architecture. Questions? Yes. Um, I know that a good way is to have the models for everything, and as you've shown, uh, if you don't have a model, then you might want to train one. But sometimes, uh, when you go in production, you are, you're squeezed for, I want to show something right now. So maybe the, the quick and dirty way is your getaway. Mm -hmm. So wh what is the balance to decide when to do it the quick and dirty way, or to go and, and learn a model right now and make the plan? 
Yeah, that's a great question because I have a slide for it. So uh, basically, if the change is not user-facing, I say do it in the model. If there's nothing that is being used inside the application, then do it inside the model. It's much easier. And TensorFlow allows very complex stuff that can be done inside the model without violating the contract. For example, you can take three models and pack them as if they're one, like take three, three graphs and build TensorFlow functions that do multiplexing, decide whether it goes to this model or the other model. So if it's not user-facing, I will do it inside the model and retrain. Um, if it is user-facing, normally I will do it inside the application because it's also easier and it's easier to control what's going to happen. So hope that answers. I'll end by saying that we're hiring. Uh, there's our link, and if you found this uh, talk interesting, I'd be happy to talk afterwards. <laughs>